Thank you very much, Dr. Spurier. One of the initial recommendations at the 2006 Welfare and Safety of the Race Horse Summit was for a dedicated lab to test racetrack surfaces, and racing surfaces have remained on summit agendas ever since. For over a decade now, the industry has had a dedicated lab for surface testing, maintenance records, weather, wind, and more. The doctor joining us momentarily has been an advocate of the Racing Surfaces Testing Laboratory since its inception, and will update us on the advances in this field. I'd like to welcome Dr. Wayne McElraith, founding director of the Orthopedic Research Center at Colorado State University. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, thanks for the invitation. This turned out a little differently than I'd planned in that uh, um, I was going to walk through the early history of this great combination uh, combined product with project with uh, is someone else changing my slides. Can I go back on these? Or? to show that picture of me. Can we go back a slide? Or is, have I got control of that? Or? Yeah, thanks. And so um, <coughs> I was going to do half the talk, and Mick Peterson was going to do the other half. He unfortunately has got laid down with COVID. And uh, so I've had to do some, uh, quite a lot of slides to, to put back in that uh, are out of my comfort zone. But anyway, just this is, it's been a really good experience having to do this talk um, on my own because I can recognize everything that Mick's done. He's been the, the leader in this, uh, in the racetrack surface testing lab. Um, I got in a strange position of being vice chair of the lab and uh, I started him off in this business and he's often said to me, I don't know whether I want to thank you for getting me involved in this business or hate you. Um, and we'll, you'll have some examples of that. But anyway, just to, to set the stage with what we are talking about and why this uh, program, which has been heavily supported by the Jockey Club and other, other groups, is trying to get uh, on top of a consistency in the racetrack. So we're going to go through a little bit of history and then it's really been exciting for me to get mixed slides and work through them with what's happened more recently. Anyway, prevention of musculoskeletal injury in the racehorse remains, remains an ideal goal for all of us. We certainly make improvements, but we're not we haven't solved all the issues, never will, but uh, we keep trying, we keep decreasing, as Tim Parkin showed earlier this morning, we keep decreasing the incidence of problems. The severe physical demands are placed on the musculoskeletal system of thoroughbred racehorses using the high speeds reached because of the high speeds reached during racing and training. And racing surface is commonly implicated as a risk factor. And of course, as you know, we have various surfaces, we have, we have dirt, we have synthetics came along, turf, and, and various speeds with which these horses race on them. The interesting thing was is that Mick and I started doing this uh, exercise before synthetics came, and of course they became an important part of what we were looking at research-wise. So just briefly, there's multiple factors involved in musculoskeletal injury, and of course, we all know that, and we work on all these areas, or we've done work on all these areas. But the important one, of course, today that we're talking about is racetrack surface. And this is how this whole project started in 1995. Mick Peterson was a professor, a mechanical engineer at Colorado State University. He knew nothing about horses. 
and myself, an equine orthopedic surgeon, I knew nothing about engineering, and, but had a desire to take racetrack surface out of the musculoskeletal injury equation. Now, we still haven't, <laughs> we still haven't done that, but, um, and now looking back, and it's 1990, it was 1995, but I've been doing surgery at, uh, <coughs> at Equine Medical Center which is, used to be across the road from Los Alamitos. There's other buildings got in the way since then, uh, since 1983. And this person on the right in the picture, Blaine Schwanevelt, is still holds the record for number of stakes wins in the Hall of Fame, a great racing quarter horse trainer. But every time I was doing surgery, uh, Blaine would wander in and talk about goddamn racetrack. And so, I was sort of wondering, okay, they'd always blame the racetrack, and sometimes these trainers would eliminate or not consider the other factors that were involved. Was that horse sound, et cetera, et cetera. So when Mick came to me interested in looking at racetrack surface, uh, it was like, yes, that'd be great. We could maybe certify a racetrack. Well, that was... A little bit difficult to do, but um, I put out a timeline, or we've put out a timeline, as to how we work through this. We actually, he started getting to know what we dealt with as far as the disease process goes and what musculoskeletal injury constituted. So I've got these divided up into uh, time periods, and we're going to go through each of those. Initially, uh, Mick came over to see us at the Orthopedic Research Center in the, in the Vet Teaching Hospital. Um, he was interested in the work that Chris Kalchak was doing. This was Chris Kalchak's PhD work with Bob Norden and myself, and, uh, and Sue James was also a bioengineer involved with it. And of course, this is well published, this work, but uh, basically the top two pictures are taken from uh, the Colorado uh, thoroughbred racetrack uh, injury database. We had a post-mortem program that was a lot, lot smaller than the Davis one, but we, we were necropsying all the horses that, uh, that uh, suffered muscular, catastrophic musculoskeletal injury. And that picture on the top left is the opposite fetlock to the one that had the catastrophic injury. And of course, you can see the associated pathology and the right-hand picture shows the micro damage that uh, Chris defined in his PhD work. And then, of course, we, we see this all the time with, uh, as a in a clinical arena where we see change on in the radiographs and then we've got more sophisticated imaging now, but arthroscopic surgery reveals that we've got subchondral bone disease. So Mick was interested in these. These are some of the papers from uh, Chris's work because we not only showed micro damage and micro cracks, that's a crack at the top, but we showed the other progressive change with remodeling, um, exercise versus non-exercise there. We showed osteocyte uh, loss and necrosis of the bone. And he actually went and uh, looked at subchondral sclerosis and developed an acoustic microscope to look at bony sclerosis in the equine limb and published on that. Our first paper in uh, looking at uh, racetrack surface was a paper that he had two of his grad students, Ral Reiser and Becky Woodward. Ral uh, went away to the University of Wyoming for a while and then came back and has been a, an important part in our uh, person involved in our orthopedic research program. This paper clarified the challenges associated with modeling the ground in the horse-ground interaction. And at this point, there was no reliable data available to describe the mechanical properties of racing surfaces. And this particular paper, although my name's on it, I would have had a lot of trouble defending it scientifically because it was all equations and diagrams um, on spring loading uh, of the bone. Then the next step was the development of the Arono Biomechanical Surface Tester. And that acronym came from Mick at that time, was in, uh, 
was in Maine at the University of Maine. He'd left CSU, and this was where we kept our relationship, and we started with funding from various groups in Southern California, started looking at, well, first of all, develop the biomechanical surface tester. And to do that, he used his experience in mechanics and the design of acoustics and vibrations from submarines. But also we were involved with work at, the C at CSU. We did studies on high-speed treadmill, the high street treadmill that we had, uh, videos at Santa Anita of the horse, and then accelerometer, that should be accelerometer data from Dr. Dave Nunnemaker, um, who's already been mentioned today by Dr. Bramlage. But, uh, it was very useful data to help build up a model to try and match the kinetics and the kinematics of the loaded lead forelimb. And that's where we also, our clinical experience was uh, useful there on how to load and track like a horse. And so this is some of the early uh, cinematography as well as diagrams to go with the phases of gait and the interaction with the racetrack that led to the design of the tester. <coughs> Excuse me. The first version of the biomechanical hoof tester was used in California. This picture on the right is at Santa Anita. There's a diagram in the middle on how the construction was, and this was when we first reported the development of that tester. And the important part of it was how it went into the ground at the angle or close to the angle and uh, went through the stance phase um, as a uh, horse would, or a horse's hoof does. So we sort of likened it to looking at the racetrack surface from the perspective of the hoof. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so this went to, uh, once we built that machine, then it was sort of a quest for, the more cons for a more consistent racetrack. Because this paper here, which was published in 2008, it accumulated, there was a lot of data collected in Southern California that we used. Accumulation of data revealed that some tracks are more variable than others. And then uh, Mick was started testing uh, at Churchill Downs in Kentucky and looked at various racetracks and was building up a database at that stage. And the important thing here is uh, that we noticed very quickly, or he noticed very quickly, was the effect of track maintenance on mechanical properties of a dirt racetrack. <coughs> it was interesting, excuse me, <coughs> it was interesting that, uh, I don't hope I've got, got COVID, um, but uh, the first study that was reported on, on racetrack surface was out of Minnesota, Canterbury Downs, in the, early, uh, in the early years. And they showed that the location of injuries was where all the water trucks came into the track. And, um, you know, differences in quality, that's pretty obvious. But the thing that was really interesting as we accumulated data was how variable the surface was in various parts of the racetrack and between days. And that was when we initially, Mick recognized that and we started on looking at climate and day-to-day -day temperature as well as uh, water content, both being really critical factors in the track. So our approach was really, as I've said earlier, these were, these were two major statements taken from a paper that was an important, it was the first time that the veterinary community or the equine veterinary community had a presentation from Mick. This was at the American College of Veterinary Surgeons meeting in 2005, how we characterized the surface looking at the way the hoof sees it. And then there was further objective assessment of the track. The next thing that he developed was Doppler radar to look at the base. And so, we st and this became really important when the synthetic track came, came, synthetic tracks came along because they had a very specific base, or if they were put incorrectly, they did. And uh, the Doppler radar would allow us to identify any divots that might be in that base. Now, we did a number of other studies. 
It's, uh, I still get a bit of a chuckle that I've got a paper in Therma Chemica Acta, which obviously is not a journal that uh, any of us here would read, including me, but um, we, it was an interesting use of the tester. This was a, a, well, probably the first classic use of the tester to demonstrate a problem and to solve a problem. What happened is when synthetic racetracks come to Southern California, it was a lot different than where they were developed in England. And uh, at Del Mar, you'd have a very nice track in the morning when it was cool. And then in the afternoon, as things warmed up and the wax melted, that uh, the times were really, really slow. And at about the time that we started doing work, now I'm using the Royal We, but I did go down there and help with part of the project. Uh, Mick had a, two PhD students working on this. The, uh, the uh, Pacific Classic, which is a mile and a quarter race, went off in two minutes and eight seconds, uh, which is really slow, obviously. And, uh, and it was very, it, we showed the gradation of temperature change in the racetrack, and that was the whole factor. And guess what? We could pretty much solve that problem with water. And that was the first time when deficient water uh, was really pointed out to be important in it. So at about the time that that, that paper was published, uh, the last paper on the overall uh, maintenance being important, uh, we had the second, this was the second welfare and safety of the racehorse summit. And uh, this was the brainchild of, of Dan Fick, who's pictured there following on, who was previously, before he went to the jockey club, was at AQHA. And uh, he was the one that sort of set up or led the uh, welfare and safety summit in 2008 where we had these workshops. And so recommendations were made. Um, there were seven working groups and of course, Mick and I were in the, the working group for track surfaces. And we had a primary objective to promote consistent and safe racetrack surface conditions. And then the related objectives were research. You can read them here, but well, you may not be able to read them. Uh, down from the seats, but anyway, review existing research and inform public and industry regarding other causes of musculoskeletal injury, including micro damage, changes in training method, unrecognized disease, potential role of rider. Like we weren't naive at that time in thinking that racetrack surface was the whole story. Obviously it's not, but to develop a research and development model for synthetic dirt and turf racing surfaces. <coughs> Down there, we've got complete the Peterson McElwraith research project, which was rather nice because they, the Grace and Jockey Club Research uh, Foundation had just funded a research project there. And so these various uh, procedures were set up. <coughs> the people, we had track surface managers, multiple people in this working group. And so we were talking about shear strength and load. It was, uh, it was a great discussion. It was an important part of the day. And from this meeting, these are the various objectives, provide track superintendents the ability for readily monitoring changes in the racetrack surface material because we didn't have any science with it at that, you know, well, minimal science at that stage. You know, track surface managers uh, were very experienced. They had their own ways of doing things. Not that they were wrong, a lot of them were correct, but uh, we wanted to try and get data and put data into the equation. So we agreed to form a Welfare Safety Summit Racing Surface Committee. And, uh, you know, the Grace and Jockey Club Research Foundation were involved in it. And the working group at the summit basically became the Racing Surface Testing Committee that uh, was mentioned in the introduction. And we did get a Grace and Jockey Club Research Foundation grant. Johnny Mac Smith told me this morning that I better acknowledge that. So uh, there it is. But um, this was a grant that we had that helped us where we went. So, you know, this is summarizing what we identified as needed. 
we wanted to create a clearinghouse for surfaces data. We wanted reliable and consistent testing, risk assessment data, sharing of methods. And so we'd already, MEC had already developed the, the tester, surface tester, as well as Doppler radar. Doppler radar was available and he managed, he used it for looking at the base as we mentioned before but a sharing of method and creating a culture of data so that all racetracks, our ideal was that all racetracks be involved. And as you'll see at the end of my talk, uh, we've progressed pretty well with that. But we started off with two machines, some work at Santa Anita and uh, Del Mar, and then it's built up into this national scheme. And I'll come back to that in a minute. So we needed performance testing. In other words, how does the track respond to those, uh, the surfaces and the tester. And then Dr. Sue Stover at UC Davis was doing in vitro work with her hoof in the box technique that was also providing useful data for us. Composition testing, what's in that, and we've gradually built up that to a really sophisticated lab that's here in Lexington now, uh, as far as looking at components that are critical to how the track behaves. And of course, there's specific ones for synthetics, there's specific ones for dirt. And then maintenance methods. And this is really important, you know, and I know that Mix presented this a lot, that it's about water and moisture content is the number one thing that can put you in too much or too little. And the variability of it is the big challenge that we deal with. But the idea was to create a culture of data, which is now looking a long way down the road, we have accomplished. Consistent track composition, consistent test methods for new materials, new methods when needed, database of results for research, and particularly being open to all users. We weren't interested in creating a patent. We were certainly getting funding from various sources, including charging for these services once the testing lab started, but it's always, it was a little hand to mouth for a long time. Uh, but we had good support from the racetracks, uh, considerable support from the participating racetracks at the time, as well as, as I said, AQHA, Jockey Club, and then uh, the Southern California Equine Foundation, the Dolly Green Foundation, these all became involved and would help us. But this was the goal a single reliable lab for the industry. So this was the first lab, the Laboratory for Analysis of Track Materials. It was basically uh, Mick Peterson's garage in, uh, in Maine. And, uh, but, and this is, and had good equipment inside and we started off with some fairly basic uh, modalities that were being tested and then it built up. And then, of course, linking the characteristics of the track to an injury database, correlating it. And, and then also the next phase was developing tests for synthetic track materials with the wax uh, being a critical component that had to be analyzed. And so this has led to some pretty sophisticated techniques that have been used. Different tracks, maintenance matters. Different tracks do things differently. And there's reasons for that. The weather's different. The design of the track, you know, it's not like you can go and change the design of the track without a lot of expense and a lot of trouble. How they're used, I think one of the challenges we have in America that uh, we don't have so much in other, other countries is that horses tend to go to the racetrack and train over the racetrack every day, the same track that they're racing during that meet. And that's a challenge for maintenance. And to develop the best practices for maintenance methods. But your maintenance, the idea is that it would be based on data, on the characteristics from testing, as well as the physical characteristics and the weather conditions. So, I'm going to fast forward to 2021. This is the, uh, the team that, that Mick has in, uh, in Lexington. Um, and of course, there's a big boost to the, the lab there and the equipment 
uh, thank you, thanks to a, uh, a grant of 750000 from the, uh, well, a contribution of 750000 from the Jockey Club, which has been enabled us to go out and uh, have four sets of equipment. Initially, we had the hoof tester uh, in California. Obviously, it's not easy to ship. Mick was driving driving it across country himself. And now we have four units, thanks to the, the Jockey Club's contribution. And I'm just going to go through. These are Mick's slides that I've uh, used and tried to understand properly for you. Uh, he, he coined the term maintenance quality system, and this is an update on the maintenance quality system, which is the aggregate result from the testing lab and from the testing at the, uh, at the tracks, and retrospective data as well. So there's three stages of MQS in this concept. There's documentation, pre-meet inspection. Now, pre-meet inspection is going and doing testing at the racetrack before the meet starts. And then once you're out there doing the testing before the meet starts, it's follow-up daily monitoring. And this is certainly, obviously um, time consuming, equipment consuming, but this is what we've, that Mix managed to lead the program to. Regulations defined by the best practices MQS and now the Heiser Surfaces regulations, and I'll come back to that shortly, are an important part of it. Testing's based on standard methods. We talked about some of those briefly then a database, and then turf research has started. And, you know, we need to still get, we, we're still not there as far as the, de the quality of turf uh, testing, but we've come a long way, whereas before it was pretty much ignored for a long, uh, quite a lot in the program, just because we were limited with what tools we could use. And, of course, as we know, turf racing is becoming increasingly, uh, an increasingly high percentage in this country, and so it's, it's really useful. And, um, and again, turf is very dependent on moisture as well. So this was a slide that Mick made for 2020. Um, uh, the, sh the places on the left are full participation uh, in the program. These tracks are also uh, NTRA certified, and uh, more recently, Colonial Downs and Woodbine and Charlestown have, have, have come on board. The, the Jockey Club uh, equipment is critical to support the growth. In other words, the equipment funded by the Jockey Club has been really critical to this. So phase one was design documentation and set up. So a racetrack's going to come into the program. They say we want to be part of it. We want to be completely part of it. And uh, so the track gets documented. The testing, as you can see, lower down on the diagram. Attention to maintenance, uniform equipment for maintenance. And then equally important are the new weather station design at five tracks. And this has been tested at five tracks. And these are very sophisticated. They're going to give you daily monitoring. And again, that's ideal to change of track. There's a lot of standards being created in sports arenas, uh, sports programs like this. But as you know, the, the equine situation in the racetrack is, is unique. Um, but, uh, and these, and of course we do suffer from big swings in, in, in weather. And like the, 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 uh, the cluster of fatal injuries in, uh, Santa Anita in 2019 that was mentioned earlier today by Dr. Benson and is, uh, it's just a good example of the limited control you have when you've got very abnormal wane, rain levels coming in. Track geometry, this is an interesting slide in that it's looking at the education. Early on in the program, 
Uh, Mick attended and spoke frequently at racetrack superintendent days. They, these events were once a year and he was there educating. This is sort of a, an increased level of education in that they're training racetrack personnel to manipulation uh, to, with laser. In other words, demonstrate proficiency with laser measurements related to the grader and what your levels are and where you put the grader. So he's called them a grader school and uh, at a recent one in Kentucky, six students or their, their workers at the racetrack or people involved in racetrack superintendent, uh, six students all demonstrated proficiency in this. So it's adapting the scientific techniques into uh, practical management. Phase two uh, is that, as I mentioned before, is at the race meet, you come out and do a do a thorough testing before the race meet starts. And so this is it where we've got not only the testing equipment down on the left-hand side, the, the hoof tester, uh, the Arono hoof tester, as well as Doppler radar evaluation for the track. And so this just brings up, emphasizes the jockey club gift, uh, which consolidated organizations updated equipment and so that we have four complete uh, vehicles equipped for the testing uh, now available. At the moment there, uh, there's one in California and there's two in Lexington and one in Maryland. And these will be, you know, won't have to travel across the whole country for them. The NTRA have also gave a uh, a really good gift to the University of Kentucky for research space and calibration of equipment, all part of the, of the hoof testing laboratory. And of course, Mick moved from Maine to, uh, to Lexington quite some time ago um, and is part of the faculty there. New equipment usage, this is just some data on site testing, for instance, at Breeders' Cup last year. 10 days, fairgrounds, uh, this is 21 data, Oaklawn Park, Pennsylvania, Laurel, and uh, locations available for both East and West Coast equipment. And uh, so in January here, there was machine calibration and load cell calibration. So the support has been really critical and, um, and with being able to transport that testing capability to the track. So this just is another, is a diagram looking at the equipment usage. It's not a diagram, but a, a summary of it. And, uh, and then phase three is the daily tracking and the measurements. And so these are just pictures taken out with uh, daily tracking. Um, and then on the right-hand bottom slide is sort of use of testing uh, the testing equipment that they're currently using for turf. And so we are, as I said before, um, the program is expanding its abilities in turf. So last but not least, how does this relate to Heiser? And these are slides that uh, Mick uh, gave me. Uh, what's been really good here is that Dr. Sue Stover, who's chair of the safety committee um, with the Heiser, uh, with Heiser has been proactive in fitting the standards and what we're doing, uh, what we have been doing into Heiser protocols. So basically, before this was a draft, but Mick told me today that this is now in effect um, everybody settled on the current version of surfaces regulations. Racetracks shall have data collection protocols in place. SOP reviewed annually and um, a practices document. And all racetrack have designs, records, tests and daily data collection. And these are just some more details that Mick gave me on the surface test methods and surface material test methods. They must be documented and consistent with testing standards. And I'll talk about those in a minute from internationally recognized standard, standards organizations. 
ASTM International, and we've been involved with, but for the more agricultural-oriented tests and standards, the American Society of Agriculture and Biological Engineers, I found out from Mecca, being more cooperative and interested. And, uh, and when possible, unpublished standards methods consist are consistent, but these are documented by the Racing Surfaces Testing Laboratory. I'll show you a list of the ones where we've got approved standards uh, shortly, but in the meantime, uh, there's a lot of consistency, there's a lot of knowledge and experience be being developed in the, in the testing laboratory. So pre-meat inspection, in other words, we've talked about this before and daily measurements. It's going to be the same with Heiser as far as uh, the racetrack conforming to the pre-race and pre-meat inspection and then daily measurements during the meet. And I think what's really critical is, uh, you know, material testing regularly for composition, weather conditions being monitored at very close intervals, and moisture content is critical. There's still further things to do. Um, <coughs> there's quite a bit of work going into the development of sensor-based moisture measurements so that the ideal will get there hopefully get there is uh, monitoring moisture real time and then putting the appropriate amount of, of water into the track. So these are the standards, ASTM uh, standards for equestrian surfaces that have been approved. Um, and you can read them here, but you'll notice that some of, a lot of these have risen out of our research. Um, again, mix leading the research uh, functional properties of equine surfaces, uh, wax binder removal from synthetic tracks, how easily it is removed, triaxial shear strength and cohesion of equine sports surfaces, standard test method for gas chromatography analysis of petroleum waxes used in equestrian synthetic surfaces, and standard test methods for measurements of transition temperatures, which I mentioned before. Uh, which we showed at Delmar rather graphically how much uh, melting of the wax changed the, the, the ability of the track to support the hoof. And uh, also part of it that's, that's also really um, important is the differences between the different products as well. And this is spun over into non-racing equestrian surfaces and um, I think is going to be <coughs> a continued part of uh, usefulness and we're leading. Uh, Mick and uh, um, with some colleagues in Scandinavia, we did write a white paper. Um, my role was very minor, I have to confess, but uh, had a white paper on maintenance of surfaces some years ago and I think It'd be really good to update that, but I think that's coming with all of these proposed standards. These are proposed standards on equestrian surfaces that I think are gonna be more and more important as we try and have uniformity uh, throughout the country under the Heiser mentality. So the next step on standards is the American Society of Agricultural and Bio Biosystems engineering for methods that, this is for the penetrometer, for turf and dirt, cushion depth, as well as documenting um, the equipment used. And, uh, and we'll probably, we'll focus on ASTM on materials testing, but have to default to RSTL when we haven't got things standardized. So now, I didn't, I mentioned, we've talked about the importance of data and working with the Jockey Club have been working on a new data system, and this is just one slide of the new database uh, interface that's gonna be available, as I understand it, uh, soon. So, finishing up, you know, obviously, safety is part of a bigger story. Um, you've mentioned the fact of data. The Equine Injury Database, of course, as uh, Dr. Parkin has championed for quite some time, 
uh, is critical to relate that back to the machines. You can see that there's a number of components to building up that database, and particularly a number of, of components that are critical for consistency of surface. Not just the equipment or the machines that, uh, that are used at the racetrack, the materials themselves, and Mother Nature has seemed to become more and more important or more and more, un more, and more unpredictable. Manpower, the methods, and the jockey injury database is also critical. Safety in horses or decreased musculoskeletal injury in horses is certainly correlated with safety for jockeys as well. So surfaces are one factor in the risk to the horse but the risk to the horse, as we said, is, is a risk to the rider. And so I think this is an important part of, uh, of getting more data and uh, making the tracks as consistent as we can. I think these groups have been critical. It's been a real team effort. It's been a huge team effort uh, led by Mick, as I alluded to before. There's been a lot of doing it on a shoestring in the early phases, and it's paid off now the investment from other support, particularly the support of the Jockey Club, is really allowing this whole dream to, to come to fruition. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. McElwraith. We are now going to take another 20 minute break and we'll come back together for our final two sessions of the day.